Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, and welcome to today's webcast discussion. We have a special guest today, Dr. Peter Smith. The webcast is going to be recorded, and we will be sure to share the link to the resources that are shared today, a link to the archive with you as soon as this presentation is over. Today's webcast is a conversation with Peter Smith about his new book, Free Range Learning in a Digital Age. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Assistant Director here at WCET for Programs and Sponsorship. As we go through the presentation today, if you have any questions, enter them into the question box. Only Peter and I have audio today, so we'll be fielding those questions and sharing them with Peter as we move along. And again, you can download the PowerPoint slides by clicking on the handout box. This is being recorded and we'll share that link to you. And we tend to have a pretty active Twitter back channel. If you want to follow along, the hashtag is WCET webcast. So feel free to post questions there and comment as well. We'll move through introductions. Peter and I will have a lively conversation and then we'll get to your Q&A. Again, if you have any questions, put them in the question box. If you have comments, you can put them in the chat box. So let's get started, Peter. For those of you that don't know Peter Smith, he has written several books, and his latest about, is all about navigating your personal learning. In this book, we'll discuss the specifics of economics of free-range learning to this conversation. So Peter has been a passionate and dedicated advocate of access to education for adults throughout his entire career. He cre created and launched the Community College of Vermont in 1970, served as the Assistant Director General for Education at UNESCO, and currently, he serves as the Organ Endowed Chair and Professor of Innovative Practices in Higher Ed at the University of Maryland, University College. Peter has also served on the WCET Executive Council for numerous years and has helped our organization and its members better serve adult students. Peter, you have anything to add? <laughs> uh, no, uh, it's, uh, I've had a great ride and I've been very, very fortunate. Well, great. And I just want to mention my audio is a little low, so I'm going to turn it up. But for those in the audience, if you'd like to adjust your volume, just click on the audio and you should be able to modify that. So let's get started. Peter, why are you so passionate about ensuring access to education for adults specifically? Well, you know, it started out, Megan, <clears throat> if you go all the way back to Vermont in 1969 and 70, uh, to me it was just a matter of, of, of fairness and, if you will, uh, small j justice. Uh, in, in the Vermont of 1970, you had to live in Chittenden County or Rutland County or Washington County, two or three places, if you're going to have any shot at all at going to college, unless you were 18 to 22. Um, and people who lived in the more rural parts of the state uh, simply by location were disenfranchised. And if you were poor or middle class, uh, you were even, you know, you were even farther out of luck. And so for us at that point, it was really a tantalizing prospect to think about how to use the vocational centers and the high school, regional high schools and local churches and businesses and daycare centers to put together, if you will, a campus, quote unquote, that was distributed throughout the state we could uh, that we could use during the off hours of whatever those off hours were, which was evenings and weekends largely. And so it was a matter just of simple fairness. And then when it took off, um, and as I, you move from philosophy to, if you will, commitment, and I began to understand over the next four to seven, eight years that um, this is a a human resource a tragedy that we were dealing with, that these were incredibly bright people. They knew all sorts of things that colleges would not or could not recognize. Uh, and there wasn't an institution that would organize itself around their needs and their life situations, as opposed to asking them to adapt to the institution's traditions and, and costs. And so it it started out as being a simple matter of fairness and, frankly, a, an interesting challenge. And But over the years, it has become, to me, really a, a, a deep social justice issue. Terrific. And so you've 
written this book and you've used the term free range learning. So to me, I just think of Portlandia where there's a bunch of free range chickens and you get to name your chicken. <laughs> so where, what is your definition of free range learning for those that haven't read the book yet? Uh, the, what, uh, let me tell you what it isn't. I do not believe that the vast majority, and I would say over 90% of the people um, in, in the world that go out to try and learn something are simply going to all of a sudden become like a free range chicken just out there learning all the time, uh, using resources in a purposeful way, uh, and that that will take the place of college. I think what I was trying to describe is that the potential we have now in the entire community, not just on campuses, but virtually any place in the country, and I would say soon to be any place in the world, the individual can in fact get access to organized learning opportunities or get access to professionals who will help him or her create uh, uh, organized learning activities that meet their needs. So what we have gone from, if you think of the campus as a very legitimate solution to an information poor society. So the campus was a place 20, 30, 40 years and further ago where you would collect precious resources precisely because you couldn't get them anyplace else. And so whether it was libraries or laboratories or professors, and they collected them there and then people went there because they had to, because there was no other way, frankly, to, to create a learning contract. Um, and so I called them oases, information oases in an information poor desert. But the desert has gone green. And the, now any place you go, any place you sit, whether I'm sitting in Santa Fe or you're sitting in Boulder or any place else, you can have access to an extraordinary array of resources, content, support, guidance, you name it. Uh, in an organized fashion, or if you want to do it yourself, you can, uh, but it, it doesn't matter um, where the resource is or where you are. What matters is how you organize those resources to meet your own needs. And so that just flips the whole deck when it comes to the traditional role of institutions versus uh, what was otherwise possible. And I think the main driver of this disruption is that the, that, that the sources of the technology and the thinking that are driving the disruption lie beyond the control of campuses, quite frankly. Um, before, uh, the vertical stack that the campus represents with faculty governance um, in a coordinated curriculum and a sequence of events was the only opportunity. It was the only offer. I'm, I'm speaking in an extreme. There were always a couple of alternatives. But that was basically it. Today, you can actually, and we'll see and are seeing colleges, I call them in the, in the book, adult-friendly colleges, organizing their resources around the needs of learners and in response to the needs of learners, as opposed to saying, we know what you need, you come to us, we'll give it to you. They're saying, what is it that you need? Let us help you get from where you are to where you want to go. And in that equation, personal learning, learning done outside of college becomes incredibly important because people bring awesome amounts of talent and knowledge with them. And heretofore that has been largely ignored, but it won't be ignored anymore. Right, and that really speaks to how technology can help democratize higher education and access in the vital role that organizations like WCT play in helping deliver that. So, Speaking of the economics of free range learning, which is how we wanted to sort of focus this conversation as well as Peter and I can focus. As the former <laughs> Lieutenant Governor of Vermont and a Congressman, you had a unique vantage point of seeing the direct impact of education on the economy of the state. What are the implications of free range learning on a state's economy as well as the national economy? Well, I think uh, I think it's going to be, I'll, I'll put it both ways. If we if we can harness this talent and and <clears throat> and we will create and validate ways to validate the knowledge that people bring with them that they did not learn through college for academic purposes or for employment purposes or for both because 
I'm a if I'm a package of knowledge, skills, abilities, and behaviors, and uh, I maybe have academic standards over here and and employment standards over here, but who I have become, my my package of knowledge, skills, and abilities, it's the same information whether I'm applying it in an academic or an employment um, environment or context. And so, what I see is, if we harness that talent, give it meaning, think. If we haven't, all that talent's walking around, it is ignored, it is wasted. I'm working on putting a number to, to what that lost, ignored asset is worth. Um, but the fact of the matter, the fact of the matter is, it, when, when you ignore it, there's a huge cost. And you think just to think of the scale of 60 million people in America, or whatever the, that's close to being the right number who have a high school diploma and maybe some college, but not a certificate or a degree. And they're all working and or engaged in their personal lives and in the economy. Uh, but if every one of them has from a little to a lot of unrecognized talent and, and knowledge and skill, that's an enormous value that is being lost. Subsequently, or on the other hand, when you do recognize it, People can move up within their existing business or agency, thus creating other opportunities, entry-level opportunities. People can, in fact, uh, start their own businesses. So I think there is an economic value, but I think it goes way beyond that. I mean, that's then good for the tax base. That is good for uh, uh, the and the social value of having engaged adults who are respected and feel that their life experience and their very being and their their cultural traditions have been respected in this regard educationally and economically what you create is a much tighter social bond and more shared aspirations and and, and I think in fact a, a a better more coherent and happier civic civic equation for people, whether it's Vermont or California or any place else. Great. So who's who's really driving this push for valuing higher learning assessment? Is that coming from the workforce, students, uh, higher ed institutions that are trying to um, sort of tap into the economics of the learning that hasn't been credentialed right. yet? Well, frankly, um, there have been some some historic champions, Kale being one of them, uh, uh, and uh, then the, the new the New York group that looks at courses and um, NCCRS and ACE ACE, and then you've had the tradition of advanced placement that was tests and that was eighteen and nineteen year olds, but the whole notion that we give people recognition. Is, is not a new idea. What's new is that we can do it at scale. We can do it for millions of people because of the technology. Uh, so those have been the advocates in the colleges I write about in the book, uh, uh, Community College of Vermont, of course, Rio Salado Community College, Southern New Hampshire University, uh, Charter Oak, University of Maryland, University College, where I currently, where I currently work. Um, but, and they are the tip of an iceberg there are probably, I'm going to say, dozens, and it may be that there is between 100 and 150 really adult-oriented colleges in this country. But overall, we have something like 2,500 to 3,000 colleges, or if you change the way you count, we got 4,000 to 4,500. So there's a huge gap between the predominant practice um, and what we are capable of doing and what lies between that gap is simply not understanding the situation on the one hand, but also at the heart of any disruptive change. Many colleges have an academic model, which is an, also a cultural model, and it is an economic model, and it is darn tough to change it. So it isn't good people versus bad people. This is a classic case of disruption where a new capacity or set of capacities is introduced into the overall context within which an industry or a business or an enterprise, in this case higher education, has historically worked. And you can see things done differently, higher quality and content, lower cost, more responsiveness, uh, clearer ability to validate what somebody knows 
clearly and specifically in a way that having somebody give you an A from behind a closed door, and I used to call that the because I say so. How do I know you know this? Because I say so. Well, uh, we can go way beyond that now in sensitive, really intelligent, project-based, evidence-based assessments. And so I think the world is changing and the game is coming. Frankly, one of my purposes in writing this book, I have no aspiration at age 72 to be the leader of anything anymore. I've had a lot of great leadership opportunities, but I want to provoke a conversation about the fact that if we wait, continue to waste this talent, we are wasting people's lives, we are wasting money, we're wasting social opportunity. And I think at a certain level downstream, you go to this the 10% versus the 90%, we have to remember the people for whom life has not gotten better over the last 40 years economically, socially, and civically. And one of the main reasons is that we have not been able to open the doors of education widely enough, and now we have the opportunity to do that. Well, that leads me to my next question. So we're all in higher ed here and I, I'll take a minute and see if there's any questions from the audience. If you do have any questions, go ahead and enter them into the chat box. Here's one from the University of Wyoming. Oh, it's a big one. Let me make it a little bigger here. I've got a couple questions coming in, Peter. So we'll take a minute here. Great. Great. I need to expand it so I can see it. From the University of Wyoming, rural and remote, much like Vermont, I'm a Kale Higher Education Consultant and Learning Counseling Instructor. How does prior learning assessment play a role in free range learning? And how can we begin to change the traditional academic culture to value experiential learning? Which is exactly what my next question was. How can we in higher ed help move the needle a, towards recognizing PLA? What a great question. Um, this may be, you know, you asked a $1 question and I'm gonna give you a $10 answer in terms of volume, but um, you're, right on, you're right on the money. First of all, Good assessment, whether it's a portfolio assessment of prior learning or an assessment of a project or work that someone has done in response to a curriculum that has been created by somebody, a college or an employer or whoever. Good assessment involves, I believe, helping the person reflect on what they've learned. So it isn't a matter of, I give you an A, that means you, you can tell me what I told you. But what I really want to understand as a result of assessment, whether it's prior learning or current, what I want to understand is how have you changed? How do you see the world differently uh, because you read Shakespeare or did a chemistry course? And that goes to how we organize our curriculum. Are we asking people simply to know and demonstrate that they know something or are we asking them to do something with the knowledge that they gain? So that connects prior experiential learning or non-academic experiential learning with the academic outcomes and the academic consequences. So I think you have to move towards outcomes kinds or evidence-based kinds of statements about assessment. And that context, I believe, and this is really uh, Im important to me as a principal, that good assessment going forward will be a pedagogy in its own right. It isn't a stamp you get at the end of the event. And I learned that from looking at and talking to learners, this time in the book, but 30, starting 35, God forbid it was longer than that, <laughs> almost 50 years ago, um, asking them or being told by them in the beginning, because I didn't know enough to ask the question, I had a woman come up to me at our first graduation at the Community College of Vermont. We had eight graduates. <laughs> Imagine that. Eight graduates. I've held up nine fingers. I really do know eight versus nine. And uh, this woman came up to me. I write about this in the book. And she said, thank you for the assessment of prior learning and thank you for the degree. I mean, it, this is awesome. But she went on to say, but thank you for helping me put at requiring me to put this portfolio together because now I know that I've always been a learner and I always will be a learner and nobody can take that away from me. 
And I've heard that from hundreds of people over the years, that the process of learning how to reflect on what it is you've learned and how you've changed and what it means to you and how you, what you can do with it, that that process of reflection creates more conscious learners, creates better learners, creates better lifelong learners. And so the first part of your question, I think we have to rethink the relationship between how we determine that somebody has produced the evidence that they've satisfied a course or a degree requirement, whatever it might be. And that is part of the work answering the second part of your question. Uh, and it's going to be tough uh, but or just difficult, but what we need to do uh, is have higher education understand I can, I'll give an example. It's an abstract example. I don't know the situation in the University of Wyoming. But if your persistence rate is 55% to the degree, and you can figure out a way to have 75% of your students persist to a degree, and there's very good evidence that people who in, engage in prior learning assessment do persist to the degree at significantly higher rates. Now, there's a question from a research point of view on causality, but if you but if you can get someone into and through that process, the chances of them being successful in, in, in completion go way up. So there's an economic incentive as well as a human potential, and oh, by the way, what are we here to do as universities if it isn't to uh, help the individual capitalize on all the human potential that they have? What I had driven home to me in these interviews that I did uh, for this book um, and the recollections I, you know, I had as a result was that we know statistically that two thirds of the re people who leave higher education and over the age of 25 do so for non-academic reasons. What I got loud and clear in these interviews is there's an enormous amount of talent out there. And historically we have looked down our noses at that talent and said, ain't going to happen here, um, that the promise of opportunity was in fact frustrated by the fact that we were not going to, and I call it knowledge discrimination in the book, that we are, we're going to, if we're going to value learning based on where it happened, not how well you know it. And to me, that's what's going to change. And that dead end sign is going to turn into an opportunity. Uh, I hope, I hope that helps. Uh, change, Changing institutional culture and economics is a brutally difficult thing to do. At a human level, it's not because of bad people involved at all. It's because we are all creatures of habit, and the academic, economic, uh, and, and, and cultural models. Uh, imagine if Ohio State said, we're going to take the $75 million we spend on football, and we're going to put it into scholarships. How would that go? Well, they may be one of the 20 or 30 institutions that actually makes money on football. But there are a whole lot of places that spend a lot and don't make it all back. But my point is, your alumni are important in the minute, and that's all part of the really hard work. You have to show how this new way of approaching assessment and understanding learning is better. It's better for the individual. It's better for the reputation of the college. It's better for the, economic, the economy in a place like Wyoming. Thank you, Peter. So the next question is uh, ties into LinkedIn, which I've been reflecting on portfolio. I got in there years ago when they were first emerging and started playing with it. And then I hadn't revisited it. But what I really like about that platform is, as you mentioned, you have the opportunity to reflect on the knowledge earned and gained and, and actually identifying that you've learned something and how that can apply. So Don Norris. Hi, Don. Good to see you here. Has a question. What impact will emerging competence marketplaces like LinkedIn which identify new competencies in people who have them, pay, which I mean, play in the functioning of free range learning. Hi, Don. Um, I, I think it's uh, part of this whole new world. You're beginning to see it uh, initially with uh, Starbucks ASU, and then more recently with Brandman and a couple of others have done some kind of an agreement with Walmart. Um, I think you're going to see um, much more uh, partnering between uh, organizations so that they collectively can offer something to their users uh, that neither could offer by themselves. Uh, and so 
I think the 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 whole notion, uh, whether it's LinkedIn or or other other entities, um, you're the days are over to, as a as a practical matter the days are over when any one institution can be good at everything they have to be good at to survive and prosper and grow in this technologically enhanced uh, free range learning world so you have to decide as an institution or an organization what is it you're going to be really good at that is good for your students learners customers employer employees whoever they are and and at the, then you have to say, who are the partners that I need that will, so that collectively we can actually provide a bundled service that is superior to anything that any of us could do alone. Um, and so that's the way I, I think about the LinkedIn uh, opportunity. But anybody thinks they're going to do it all themselves, uh, I think, is, uh, is making a big mistake. And we have a question from Russ here at WCET. To make free range learning happen implies a set of competencies for each program that could be acquired through courses of life experience. Given academic freedom and the huge backlash against Common Core at K-12, what are the strategies to encourage disciplines to create these competencies? Um, you know, Russ, um... There's a reason why I started three colleges, but nobody ever asked me to stick around and run them the second 10 years. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think the Common Core is a, is a great example of how the, the, the ultimate decentralized notion of American life, uh, whether it is operationally accurate any longer or not, uh, or to what degree, uh, just shows how fraught this whole thing is. The most hopeful examples that I see, frankly, I, I think you're going to see entity non-governmental entities. I think we're entering a, a time where, believe it or not, in my mind, regional accreditation, NC, Sarah, the kinds of things that are happening where horizontally we're having national responses that are not federal and are not in governmental or controlled by those entities. Uh, and I think that is a feature I'd be willing to, I wouldn't give odds, but I take even even odds that uh, you're going to see more of that kind of thing. And so I look at the credential engine work that's being done uh, uh, nationally with lots of people. I think Lumina is supporting it. I think we're going to begin to see um, uh, frameworks that come. And I think colleges, frankly, are going to be pressed to show how what they do relates to the framework. In the old days, they could get away with saying, you show me how the framework relates to what I do. I don't, I don't think that that's going to survive. So you're going to see adaptations. I don't, for a minute, uh, you know, think that uh, we are going to have uniform job descriptions with competency structures and, you know, uh, in, in the 25,000 job categories or whatever it is there are in the country for a while. But I, I do think we're going to see some norms. You see it with Credly. Uh, you begin to, in portfolio, you see um, an integreed. What they're, what they're beginning to do is uh, create structures that employers say is uh, the structure that, that works for me. And when people start to say that works for me, then higher education institutions of the more traditional type adult friendly hopefully are going to have to show how they relate to that um, and if they can do that that's a sunrise not a sunset uh, if they can do that it's going to be a new time of opportunity for them with a reinvented and reinvigorated mission and it's going to be great new opportunity for millions of people who through no fault of their own in most cases miss the boat the first time around at age 18 and want to have a chance to get back on that boat and get some opportunity Great, thank you, Peter. So I, I want to jump into a question, and we have a few more from the audience that I'll get to, but I want to jump into a question. I know we at WCET recently just posted a blog follow-up about Rio Salado and their uh, success and quality, um, but really it's about this hurdle with the iPads data and Rio Salado. In your book, uh, as well as Joyce Judy, president of the Community College of Vermont, says, 
iPads data has nothing to do with reality. So how can we help change the iPads data, data to capture actual completion for all learners? And what could organizations like WCET do to help identify actual learning? I think, I think the thing, uh, and I don't, hold myself out as a, I, I, I've had a lot of experience with the consequences of iPad. And uh, I'll start from a situation, I'll get to the WCET part of this in just a sec, but it, the, I, the consequence, iPads is used to determine how effective an institution is. Now, on the other hand, if I need to get financial aid, I have to sign up for a certificate or a degree program because that's the only way I can get financial aid. What happens if I have learning needs that are three or four courses, or um, but they, I don't need the certificate or the, or the degree What this time around? I want to get that particular set of things, and I, I, have, I get what I came for, I go home happy, um, and I look like a failure. And especially, and then if that were my first time, second, third, and fourth times, it's, it's even worse. As opposed to a system where somehow, and I'm not the technologist here, you could understand a lifetime of learning and the ability of a person with need to accumulate uh, bits and pieces of learning or to have bits and pieces of learning they've accumulated someplace else recognized so that the question became in terms of organizational or institutional effectiveness, did learner A get what he or she came for right. or did they not? And that, and at the same time, I can go away and come back and when I need more. Do I need a degree right now? I'm at a 16 year old in Phoenix when I was briefly living in Phoenix uh, seven years ago and he said I said what you gonna do and he said I'm gonna go um, to the community college when I graduate and I'm gonna get my uh, computer-based automotive technician license and then I'm gonna be making about eighty thousand dollars a year and then I'm gonna look around and then I may decide to go to the university after that well I thought wow uh, the good news is he had a real clear path in mind for himself. But I think there are going to be many more paths. And so the, the obstacle for policymakers is to understand a way to let eligibility for financial assistance fit the person at the point in time when they're trying to learn something that is part of an organized educational sequence, but to not tie that to completion in some two, three, four year sequence uh, because in many cases and especially with adults going and coming beginning to stack things uh, having experiential learning recognized it all adds up it's a mosaic of learning and what we we have historically for because there was no alternative have sort of looked at learning like a package of fig newtons you know there's 25 of them and Boom, 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 boom. Well, I think we're into something. Uh, I can't finish that metaphor, by the way. But I think we're into something uh, much more dynamic than that. And the challenge for WCET, the policymakers, and in this case, the, the, the people who create financial aid and collect data on institutional effectiveness, is how to create a system that is responsive to the individual and at the same time measures institutional effectiveness in terms of meeting the needs of the individual as they come through the door. Well, I'm glad Russ is on to hear that. So <laughs> he needs something to keep him busy, right? Mm. And me, out of trouble. Right, right. Let me jump to another question here. This is from our friend Kelvin Bentley. What do you think will be needed to create a culture of OER-based teaching in which the default instructional content in our courses is OER-based? And are there good examples of schools that have tenure and promotion based on, in part on OER scholarship? And I will say, as we're building out the WCT annual meeting program, that really was a prevailing theme this year. So I sense just the difference between last year and this year that there's a lot of momentum behind national and statewide and institution-wide OER initiatives. You bet. Well, we have uh, some hard experience with that at, at UMUC. 
I'm not the person to really talk about it. Kara Van Dam is. Uh, also, I have the great honor and wonderful opportunity of serving on the, the board of the Open Education Consortium, uh, which is a global the, the global OER consortium. And um, I'll explain that slide in a minute. Uh, and the, the what we found, the, the opening to using OER, we know it saves the learners money, but it is a lot of work. There is disability-related concerns that have to be addressed in terms of alternative or defaults for people with learning disabilities uh, or, other, or other ways that hamper the traditional notion of going about it. Um, so if you are afraid to start, you'll never learn. And that's the hardest thing in academia is <clears throat> to start and then learn from your experience and get better and better at something. Uh, we're, we're in the process of working that through, uh, and it may be that OERs aren't the, the best way to do everything. But we do know that we saved our learners something in the neighborhood of 19 or 20 million dollars last year. Um, we had some problems also, uh, and we're sorting it through. I don't know of anybody who has taken it institution-wide, which is where we started, uh, and at the same time has connected all that and OER research to tenure and promotion. I just don't know of anybody. What I, what you're looking at on this slide, if I can just, I hope that's a helpful answer. Um, the, this is research done by a fellow named Alan Tuff, who unfortunately died a couple of years ago. He's Canadian. He did this research in the 1960s, and it changed my, my life uh, when I read his book, it's called The Adults Learning Projects. And I read it when I was at Community College of Vermont, 1970-71, and I literally got in the car the next day and drove to Toronto, Canada. He was at OISC in Toronto. Because he was doing research, which has subsequently been confirmed again and again and again, dozens of times. The average adult commits more than uh, 700, 800 hours to learning. That's 15 hours a week. That, that's a lot of time. And th these projects, if you look at the other, at the black panel, they do these things purposefully. Um, it, whether it's learning how to invest better or reading about uh, Mexico because you're going to go to Mexico or child psychology because you're about to have a baby or something on the job uh, that you're doing to do better. But what was astonishing is at the middle panel that adults forget most of the lessons. That doesn't mean that the learning goes away. It's that they absorb that learning and it just becomes part of who they are. And so they, they, don't, they are not able to remark on it or identify it. And so what happens is uh, when you learn, you change. And, the, and that led me to this whole notion of turning points and transitions in life and the relationship between learning and reflection on your learning, knowing what it is you've learned. And I don't think undergraduate institutions do a very good job, by the way, of helping us think about that either. And then as you change, continually understanding and up if you will, updating your your image of who you are and who you're becoming. And I write about that in the book, in the first section, in the beginning of the second section. To put it, uh, and this is just my opinion, uh, when Gail Sheehy wrote Passages, she was talking about a midlife crisis. And the passages were negative. One of the reasons that, and that's happened to me, one of the reasons is, I believe, because as if you're me, as you shave in the morning, you're looking at yourself in the mirror and you're thinking, you know that guy, but all the time you're changing. And then something happens where you have to take stock and you look again at that person and you say, I don't know who that is. And, it, and I write about it in the book personally. Um, and there are stories of learners in the book who the, the sum total, the aggregate value of their life learning, their personal learning and their experience um, aggregates and changes them. And Alan Tuff gives us the data. Uh, 
that then translates into the opportunity educationally for us to help people assign a value to what they've learned and how they've changed that is good for them personally, that is good for them academically if that's what they want, or is good for them economically if that's what they want. So that to me, uh, there is the, the un unrecognized learning is not only financially costly, I think it's humanly costly. And people who can't get over that hump, that transition, I call them prisoners of their own experience. And uh, we've all been there, I'm sure, for a moment or two. Some people are there for a long time. And I think that's where education and learning and thinking about it differently with the tools we have today that we didn't have through technological enhancements gives us a much more powerful role to play with adult learners. Peter, I know several people in my life um, have the traditional notion of higher education and don't think it's for them. And I think that's very typical is that everyone on this webinar today and part of this conversation is open to innovation and sees the need and the momentum that's taking place. But they're the people that need to know that there's these opportunities out there aren't necessarily hearing the message that higher education is evolving. How do we help articulate that and help people understand that there are avenues to getting some credentials, some degrees, um, including some of these alternative providers? How do we help market better? Yeah, well, I think it's uh, it's that's a it's a great question, uh, uh, Megan. And <clears throat> first of all, there's a, the people we're getting um, are directly related to the to the role that institutions are playing in becoming more adult friendly. And I think it's critical that once somebody decides to reach out through our marketing or our, our branding or whatever, uh, that we're ready for them. That we don't say, oh, by the way, no, we don't have childcare, or no, we, you know, we, we've got to really think hard. It, online and blended learning and free range learning is not uh, the same old, same old, but now on uh, with technology. Uh, so I think there's there's a lot to do with institutions thinking about what it means to be adult friendly, and the way I would do that is not with a, uh, a, a session of my employees, I'd go find, I'd go do uh, uh, focus groups with adults in my community, find out what's stopping them. Uh, some of it's psychological, some of it's physical, some of it's emotional, some of it's financial, and you'll see those stories. But the people we're getting, almost every one of them has a moment, and I write about it in the book, a turning point where they say, that's it. In one case, it's having, overhearing people say, so this woman's not going to get the promotion she's applied for because she doesn't have a degree. She says, that's it. Another uh, woman asks her eight-year-old, uh, what are you going to do when you grow up? Well, I'd like to be a marine biologist, I think it was. Something very, very much like that. But I guess I can't do that because neither you or dad went to college. So I'm not going to go to college. And she said, that's it. And she went home that night and registered, in that case, for the Community College of Vermont, I'm happy to say. And um, I asked her, so what's up with Billy now? And she said, oh, he's graduating from college this year, I mean, from high school this year. And uh, he's going to the university. And I said, he's going to be a marine biologist or whatever that thing. She said, no, no, he's changed his mind. He's going to be a civil engineer. <laughs> but the point is, there came a time and she took it. Now. For all the other people who haven't gotten to that turning point, I think there, are, I would say there are three. You've got to decide where it is that people cluster together socially. Um, one place is work. Two place, second place is their community, nonprofits, et cetera. And the third place could be a local college or a local resource. But you've got to, the days are over when college is becomes the main thing I do. And so I would argue that the workplace needs to become a learn place, a formal learn place, as well as an informal learn place. That the, 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 the YMCA, maybe, I'm, you know, wherever, the League of Women Voters, um, or uh, any, all think of the groups um, uh, 
uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting into it. The, the stores where you take in your used goods and they make them available for free or for reduced uh, price, and I'm just blanking on the name, yes, Goodwill. Goodwill. Yeah. Right. Good, uh, so you know, find, you know, find where people go as a part of their lives, where they live as part of their lives, and go there and become part of that. To me, that, so the marketing and the branding is, what, so for WCET, okay, let's imagine a business and a college and the individuals, what's the technology? What are three or four models? How does that happen? Or if it was goodwill versus this versus that. Um, because what you've got to do is catch people who are denying themselves the opportunity. And there's a lot of that, and I write about it, but that's because we taught them. We, we convinced them at an early age that this isn't for you. And now we've got to figure out a way to bring it back in a really special, human, respectful way. Great. Okay, a couple more questions. We're getting toward the end of the hour here. Callie Morrison, who was formerly with WCET, she mentions Peloton U, which I think probably was just emerging as you were writing your book. Uh, yes. But that is a really interesting model. And from what I understand, I don't know Peloton all that well, but Van Davis is on their board, so we've spoken a little bit about it. But Peloton is based in Austin, and it is a program where students taking competency-based programs can come and they have a mentor to help guide them through the process. And that includes everything from financial aid and um, and it has to be in person, which I think is a really interesting and unique model, especially in the work that we're in. So Callie's question with that little bit of context is, how can programs like Peloton U scale to support students learning independently and, and competency-based models? Well, Callie, you know, thank you for a really hard question uh, because I really do, I don't there's a lot I don't know about Peloton, but you know what it makes me think of immediately um, is um, Minerva. Now it's a totally different model than Minerva, but what Minerva has done is they have offices and programs on five continents, and you move around from continent to continent, but they have one curriculum, and so. You go to London, you do community service, you live in a, a, the YMCA or the equivalent, you have counseling and advice, but when you go to school, there is a Minerva office, you go there, and then you're going to school with people in Hong Kong, San Francisco, Melbourne, Australia, and Mumbai. And you have a teacher in the room, right? But you also have a, a subject matter expert who has put that curriculum together. So it's a very interesting blend. But get beyond the model to uh, th some form of this might work for Peloton, where they know what their model is. What they need to do is create a high degree of consistency across multiple sites because learning. You know, they've they've made their decision. Learning is a social activity. You you have to you, for most people. Uh, I think it's 93 percent, something like that. You need social interaction to learn, um, and and so I, I, you know, whether I would go as far as they have, as I understand it, I don't know. Doesn't matter. There are going to be a lot of models, but what they can, I think, the way they could scale, if you will, is to figure out how to use technology to replicate the the, the parts of the model. <coughs> excuse me, that need to be consistent and high quality in order to hold the whole enterprise together uh, and then localize in different places uh, the, the staff. But everybody has common training, common outcomes, uh, common assumptions professionally. That's That would be my immediate thought about it. Great. I, I agree. And Callie said she does apologize for this difficult question, and it is uh, very personalized, which I, I did miss that piece in my description of Peloton. So, Along those lines, how are you seeing alternative providers like edX and Straighter Line and Guild Education influencing the actual business of higher education? I think a um, or more of a yeah, competition. I, I, oh, I think it's I think it's uh, it's going to be partnerships. It's going to be frenemies, and it's going to be competition. All I mean, it all depends. Um, I, there are. 
and I think what we have to get used to, and I'm going to make this up, but say I'm a, an unaffiliated working person and I uh, learn about the greed. Uh, I read about the greed in the, in the book. Um, and I start taking their courses and getting their counseling and their support and uh, all of a sudden and they're tied up and they're connected with a bunch of employers and uh, all of a sudden I get another job. Uh, that is a better job for me, or I get promoted in my own work because of what I've done, and I never went back to college. That's happening, and it's going to, and the greed is, I think, would say, yeah, that's good, that's cool. At the same time, if there's a college that says, I like to figure out what the greed is doing, and try to figure out how we can work with them, so that if someone wants a certificate or a degree, or needs it, based on the particular thing they're, they're trying to get good at, will be there for them. So there's a partnership. Um, and and to me, uh, there it, we're just going to see a lot of different combinations. What I find really interesting about Straighter Line, and they're, you know, they've been around a long time. They're, they're old timers in this uh, world, 10 years or something. But they're starting, one, they now got I don't know, 150 or 200 partners. So they are partnering, and and the evidence is, as I understand it from some of their partners, pretty compelling that people who can do two or three courses at Straighter Line have a great chance of being successful at their college. So the, the idea that you can actually help first-time returning learners, uh, if you will, get wet, with online and blended learning through partnerships, I think um, become, it's going to be very attractive. So I may only get 75% of a person's time and learning, but I'm going to get all of it because they come, they're ready to learn, they know how to learn online, and they're going to persist to the degree. That's better for them, and it's probably better for me. Sure. Great. Well, I'm going to just skip through some slides here, go the right way. We talked about adult-friendly classes. Here's some of those new providers. And then uh, there's a question here from David. Hi, David. David Kendrick. How are our state and U.S. legislators viewing or embracing these structures? Are they an enigma or a new pathway? And perhaps your experience in Vermont could help well, shed the <laughs> That was a long time ago, David. Um, the, um, I think the, 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 the really important perspective I have gained and, and reasonable people, we used to say when I served in the Congress, reasonable people can disagree. Uh, regrettably, we don't see much of that these days, but uh, the most policy starts out being autobiographical. In other words, people making policy have spent, the, the, the immediate thing they go back to is what was their experience in education and in general, it was probably pretty good. And it was probably, in most cases, pretty traditional. So they start with that lens, and then they, in some cases, move out from that base. Um, and so if I were thinking about public policy, um, I would really start to try to figure out how to help people start with a solution that will meet the need of the situation, whether it's an economic development situation or an access to education situation or some combination, and then reverse engineer that back to the best model that works to solve that problem. As opposed to saying, how can this college solve that problem? Because then you immediately start with the constraints of the existing model. If you had the free hand to do that, that'd be my advice. I think for, for policymakers in, in Vermont um, 50 years ago, we just uh, we said we aren't going to have a campus. Now they have 12 learning centers, but there has never been a home campus, never. That we're going to use existing facilities, so that makes sense economically. We're going to be low cost, and we're going to be community-based and employment-oriented. Um, there were still, look, we survived in the Vermont State Senate by three votes my fourth year. Um, 
And we survived by, we actually were taken out of the budget the year after I left the college, 1989, no, no, 79. We were taken out of the budget in the house and put back in because people raised hell. But the fact of the matter is it was not an easy ride. And I came bluntly from an old Vermont family, uh, been around for 200 years, and I was trading on that without ever trading on it tactically. And the fact I went to Princeton, et cetera, et cetera. I was using all of that quite implicitly, never explicitly. And we just barely skinned by. I actually was back about five years after I left in the state house and a guy came up to me absolutely opposed. He was a, actually worked at one of the state college campuses. And uh, he looked at me and he says, Peter, she says, you know, it's amazing how good that community college has gotten since you left. <laughs> and I said, Cola, isn't that great? Wouldn't you always want it to get better and better? So there's also knowing, in my case, when to go. Because institutions don't mature and grow up until, I believe, the third leader. And that's when it becomes institutional in its values. And so I didn't, I can't tell you I knew that in, 1978, nine, when I left, I knew I couldn't do the job very well anymore because they were asking me to do things I didn't know how to do with my master's degree in teaching social studies. So I thought, good time to, good time to move on. And it turned out to be a great move for the college and a great move for me as well. Great. Thank you. One final question, Peter. And I think this is from someone that joined after we had, um, Ask for your definition of free range learning, but just quickly tell us what the difference is between free range learning and competency based education. Oh, well, I think, well, I would use evidence based as opposed to competency based because I think it's a little, it's a little broader to sort of, it feels broader and more flexible to me. Um, but that is the way that we can begin to capture all of the learning that people do formally or informally in their lives is not by predetermined course titles, but by predetermined evidence requirements that people can add it to. For me, free range learning, where we're at, if I'm an individual, and it almost doesn't matter how sophisticated I am or how much education I have, this is old Vermont metaphor. It's like skiing in a blizzard with no goggles. You know, you sort of, you know, there's so many opportunities out there. And our job as educators is to organize pathways out of those multiple opportunities. So if someone wants to chart their own path, we can help them do that. But if they want something that's personalized, but a little more predetermined, we can help them do that. I believe that I did talk about it assessment and validation of learning as an emerging pedagogy. I think, I believe that changing the way we help people understand what they have learned and how they have changed uh, becomes, it moves that into the central pedagogical uh, engagement uh, in education and not as something you do at the end. Yeah, it, thanks for speaking to that. And a quote that really resonated with me in the book was from Dr. Paula Blanc about how institutions really need to prepare to move from conductors of education to curators of individual education plans. So beautiful. Excited to beautiful. see that momentum. All right. Final call for any other questions? Any final thoughts, Peter? Peter will be at our annual meeting in Portland if you want to grab a book and have him sign it. I'm sure he'd be happy to do that. Oh, of course. Um, uh, well, Megan, I just want to thank you and WCET for letting me do this. You know, the the fact of the matter is that, and I've got my copy right here, um, doing this work uh, has changed my life as well. I um, It has deepened my understanding of the, of the value. I used to think these were good ideas, right ideas, important ideas, blah, blah, blah. I, I feel much more deeply about uh, the obstacles we have unwittingly, in some cases, wittingly in others, placed between a majority of our adult population and um, the ability for them to be all they can be. Despite our mythology of, you know, Horatio Alger, live and learn, school of hard knocks, that's not the way it works for most people. And um, to me, it, it, it have an opportunity to exchange thoughts and ideas with um, uh, your members and 
cool bunch of people about this important thing is it means a great deal to me. So thank you. Terrific. Well, thank you for your time. So I'll just move through these last slides. Again, all of our recorded webcasts are available on the WCET website, including this one, which will be posted soon. Thank you to the WCET supporting members and our sponsors that underwrite much of our programming here and make things like this possible. So again, thank you to Peter. Thank you to my team here at WCET for helping support this webinar. And thank you for your excellent questions and participation. We'll see you on the next webcast. Bye, all. Okay. Bye, Peter. Thank you. Thank you.